Good evening and welcome to tonight's King's Talk about strategy in F1 racing. My name is Greg Hunter and I'm the Deputy Head Co-Curricular at King's. And tonight we are pleased to welcome back OKS and old schoolhouse boy, Chris Lark. Chris completed his Masters in, in Engineering at the University of Cambridge before becoming the F1 strategist working for Flando Alonso and now Lando Norris. Interviewing him will be his old house master and current head of boarding practice, Matt Thornby. After his interview and talk, we will be taking questions from you, the audience, and please, at any stage, would you type your question into the Q&A function as part of Zoom, or alternatively, put your virtual hand up after the presentation, and we put you on the air live to ask the question yourself. And now is a warm welcome to both Chris and Matt. Thank you, Matt. Over to you. Thanks, Greg. Lovely. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Um, I, I thought just by way of an introduction, I, I thought I might just take you back to your school days a little bit. Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of current pupils here, so I think they'd perhaps kind of enjoy your, your school journey as well. And I might ask you a little bit about your memories of Kings before you go on and talk a little bit about your career now. Um, just as a way of an introduction, then Chris joined the schoolhouse um, boys in 2006 at the same time as I did, actually, uh, as a house master. They were my first set of shells. And at the risk of offending any other schoolhouse OKs joining us tonight, they turned out to be my best sporting year of my entire 12 years in the house. Um, Chris's schoolhouse year in the shells was actually really quite small at the start. Uh, others joined along the way. Um, I must have been quite scary because I asked them all to go to meals together. And actually, I think they pretty much retained that message for the entirety of their five years and were still <laughs> doing that when they were in six A's. Just to give you a little bit of background, on Chris and where he ended up to end up, I've actually managed to dig out my housemaster report when he was in six A's and, and I'll share a little bit with you. Um, it, it reads, in the past couple of weeks, prizes in maths, physics, chemistry and sport have arrived on my desk for me to pass on to Chris, which will ensure he has plenty to pick up on speech day and will not run out of holiday reading material. The first three come with the territory of being a potential Cambridge undergraduate and our deputy head scholar, but the latter gives an indication of how rare and sickeningly multidimensional someone like Chris really is. The photographs on my wall of success will ensure that all that pass through Schoolhouse are aware of his sporting ability, but I would need to remind the whiners yet to come that much can be achieved in all environments of school life without diluting performance. I go on to say that on a personal level, Chris has been a regular in my study this year for some idle gossip. He even came to me for some relationship advice um, and then did exactly the opposite. I'm glad I could be of help. Um, i finish with organisation, desire, commitment and a sense of responsibility are crucial, all of which Chris has in spades. Perhaps he will come back and give an assembly. And I said that in 2011. So I'll, I'll count this as the assembly. Um, so maybe, I don't know, ignoring that, reflecting on some of that, Chris, could perhaps you just share a little bit about your time at King's and, and kind of any abiding memories that you might have? Well, I'm only 10 years late coming back, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, an interesting year with just seven of us in Schoolhouse to start, I think. And um, fortunately, most of the sports competitions were five to seven aside, so we could just about field the team. Um, but yeah, we ended up quite a close-knit group as a result. Um, I think there were two dorms of four, maybe, between us, um, rotating between. Um, yeah, it was uh, at the start, and then obviously going up through the years, we gained some people from day, day houses. We gained a couple of guys, joined us in the sixth form, um, but remained a, a good group <clears throat> and all quite heavily sport focused, which was quite nice for particularly me with a desire to get involved in that kind of stuff. So it was good. Much as you've ended up in a slightly different field, um, you would say that the school was still a big part of kind of fueling your desire for sport. It's kind of clearly top of your abiding memories of being at school and, and probably kind of underpinning why you are where you are, yeah? I mean, definitely. The, the kind of resounding memory for me is the fact that you were basically living with your best mates and you could go and play with them all day, every day. So we had, what, Sundays playing for six hours, playing hockey on the Astro at the rec centre. We, every evening, you'd go out onto Mint Yard, I think, and play touch rugby in the summer. Uh, <laughs> There was some obscure games of cricket outside the assembly hall, Shirley Hall, I seem to remember, but those were slightly more frowned upon by staff. So a bit more in the background here and there. Um, but yeah, basically wherever there was space, we had a bit of a run around. And actually the, one of the most entertaining memories that sticks is the uh, lacrosse match, the Purple's lacrosse match on Green Court. I can't remember much about it, but I, that was um, 
interesting to say the least and a bit different. Not your game, no? No. no. Well, to be honest, I think I just played hockey, but with a lacrosse stick. Mm. So. Um, very much, I mean, it's lovely that like, nearly 100 people are joining us right now. And, I, and again, I said to you just a second ago that I think it's indicative of the fact that, that sport has become really important for us during lockdown. There hasn't been a huge amount to do. And sometimes when you actually say, OK, should global sport be happening? And there isn't many more global sports than Formula One. Um, but the fact that actually it's been quite an important part of people's lives and, and clearly Formula One racing has always had a long held status. So I think people are absolutely really interested um, to hear what you've got to say. Um, I think first and foremost, you'll probably deal with what a strategist actually does um, and then talk about decision making in sports. So I'm very happy to hand over to you because I think the majority of this talk is going to be fielding people's questions afterwards. So I'll, hold you, I'll hand over to you and thanks again for joining us, Chris. That's great. Thanks, Matt. So, um, yeah, we, well, so race strategy is very much the tactical element and uh, very much numbers based these days. I mean, uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your outlook, um, sport is very much now uh, an analytics game. There's a lot of percentages, a lot of possibilities. Uh, and we effectively are filling in that role for the Formula One world. Um, so I, Went from, came from school to Cambridge, did engineering, just uh, basically more and more numbers based stuff, learning about statistics, how it all works. And uh, yeah, went from there to do the grad scheme at McLaren. So I ended up on a two year rotation at McLaren from the graduate scheme, which was actually uh, kind of for fear of uh, just plugging the scheme that I loosely help uh, run now, but we, are probably the only team that do like a nice rotation through all the departments. So I spent two years doing some design work, some manufacturing stuff, uh, spent a bit of time in finance, learning how uh, all of the budgeting things work, which is something that I am still not very clued up on or not very good at. Um, but through every department, um, for those of you who are a bit more interested in the technical stuff, there's, there's kind of aerodynamic development. So all of those weird little winglets and fingers that you see on the car, those are very specifically, you have a group that's looking just at the front wing of kind of six or eight people and a group that's looking just at the rear wing and just at the bodywork and stuff. So I had the opportunity to cycle through all of those, um, which I think is probably uh, unique to McLaren graduates and the technical directors of each of the 10 Formula One teams. So very fortunate in that regard to have been able to see pretty much everything that goes on behind the scenes and uh, build some good relationships with people in all the different departments uh, across the company, which is uh, pretty unique. So um, in terms of kind of uh, understanding how the sport works and uh, what all the different inputs are and how they come together, uh, very valuable. So from there, during those two years, sorry, I then had the opportunity to volunteer on race weekends so the strategy team at the time was led by my current boss um, but they introduced a, a weekend volunteering scheme where effectively anyone from any department in the company could come and help out uh, with the race strategy stuff and uh, I volunteered signed away for free a chunk of my weekends which at the time was fun and interesting but little did I know that it would lead to a kind of long-term career decision uh, and then was fortunate enough to move into that department. Uh, conveniently timed with the end of my two years, they had an opening, so ended up joining them. Um, so that was kind of the introduction to McLaren. And in a minute, I'll probably do a bit more on what strategy is as a whole. But um, yeah, through, through the two. Um, so yeah, in race strategy, what we tend to do is uh, we're basically Sunday focused. So for those of you that are less involved in F1, um, we generally have 20 to 23 races in a calendar year. And um, we run, we turn up on a Wednesday or Thursday, uh, set the garages up. And then on Friday, we have practice sessions. On Saturday, we qualify, which is effectively setting the fastest lap you can. Uh, and then on Sunday, we have the race, which is 300 ish kilometers generally takes about two hours. And uh, that's kind of our time to shine in the strategic side. So there's, uh, so there's kind of the performance guys effectively 
run the first two days of the weekend and we are learning and gathering information and trying to work out how the cars are operating. Um, but to an extent, we're given a, a driver car package on Sunday morning and trying to get the best out of that in the race um, in terms of how many pit stops we'd like to do, when we would like to do those pit stops relative to the cars around us and what tyres we'd like to fit and how we get the most out of our drivers. Um, so for me, uh, the biggest benefit really is the fact that it's a, a um, like a human interaction thing. We've got, a, in my case, a 21 year old boy who's in his, well, I say boy, man, in his third season in Formula One who, uh, is still learning huge amounts every year and we've got to get the most out of him while he's going around the circuit at 180 kph or whatever it may be um so the interaction with him is kind of the, the key part really for me um so uh in terms of the guys i've worked with so we started with fernando in 2018 i don't know if any of you know of I've heard the name Fernando Alonso. So he was in his 17th season in Formula One at that point. Um, very much as a, well, I think it was my 25th birthday was my first race in Australia. Um, and unfortunately, running a race in Australia means getting up at midnight, briefing the drivers. Uh, so, sorry, I neglected to mention that I'm normally factory based, so in the UK. So getting up at midnight in Woking. Um, heading into the factory, we brief the drivers at about two or three in the morning, and then they go off and do all their marketing stuff at the track. Uh, the race happened at, I think, six o'clock in the morning, and then uh, we had quite a good result, so a few of us ended up in Weatherspoon at 9 a.m. for my birthday, my 25th birthday, to celebrate a good result and, uh, and my, my birthday. So slightly obscure 25th birthday, but uh, it was a good experience nonetheless. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, a memory that will stick forever. But uh, from a kind of standpoint of introducing myself to the sport, certainly working with someone of Fernando's experience was very different because we, when, when you speak to the drivers and you brief them, I've come in as a, it's clearly my first year running a car in Strat from the strategic point of view, and he's got 17 years experience and he challenges everything you say and uh, really makes you think about it and really puts you on the spot. So. It was quite an interesting challenge, but certainly uh, I'm glad I had a kind of a driver of his caliber for my first season because you learned a huge amount from him. Uh, and then the kind of the, I would say the highlight of my career so far has been really actually teaching Lando and coaching Lando from, from the very basics. So uh, for those of you, again, who aren't hugely into it, Lando Norris is a British driver. He's in his third year now and he started with McLaren in 2019. So when he signed his contract, uh, probably September 2018, we were then tasked as the engineering side on, on his car to train him up from scratch uh, from every standpoint in terms of car performance, strategy, how we would like to run a race, how we communicate. Um, so uh, taking all of that learning from Fernando and trying to make sure that Lando understood how a race plays out, what the situations are in the car, how uh, how we would react to incidents early in the race and late in the race and trying to uh, <clears throat> introduce him to some of the ways we communicate stuff. Uh, so I think from my point of view, probably the remote, most rewarding part to date was uh, picking up with a fresh, exciting talent and trying to make him a more rounded driver than just someone who could deliver over a single lap. And hopefully in season number three of, of that partnership, we're beginning to deliver somewhere near, near our best. I mean, you talk about working with him. I mean, what, what changes do you think you can make? He's already a super talented racing driver. So, I mean, what kind of percentages are you looking to kind of get out and what, what kind of development, what areas are you really looking to say, right, we can improve this and this? So I think most of the work he does is with the performance engineering guys. So they're picking up on the details of his driving style and how to get the most out of the car. Um, <clears throat> those guys spend hours and hours together. Uh, but from this kind of strategic point of view, we need to make sure that he can execute the plans we come up with. So he needs to buy into them. He needs to feedback 
how he thinks the tires will behave over the course of a stint, how, uh, like, if there's an incident and there's a safety car, for example, what the fallout from that might be, whether the, he'll struggle to restart and get overtaken loads after the, after the incident. Um, and we, we need to make sure that he's aware of what the feedback he is giving is instantly, because often in those situations, you have five, 10, maybe 15 seconds to react. At which point saying, um, at the beginning of a sentence is the difference between <laughs> making that decision in time and not. And it sounds somewhat, uh, obscure and ridiculous to say, but, um, those those fine little margins are kind of the difference between making it into the pits or not in that situation and suddenly you can be three or four cars further back if you miss that opportunity so obviously preparation is a big thing but how do you how do you improve as an individual with that kind of instantaneous decision making I mean, what, what, how, have, how how have the company developed you as a, as a as as a kind of a thinker so one of the most unpleasant experiences of my job is listening back to myself. So we, after the, I mean, the whole uh, process is kind of a constant cycle where we prepare for a race weekend, we run the race weekend and then we review it. So at the end of every race, I run a, a full replay of, of the entire thing. So I sit down for two hours and I'll have the TV feeds up, I'll have all the timing data coming in and all of the intercom channels that we've spoken on, all running synced and in time and uh, listen back to it, listen back to the, the things I've said, how I've said them, um, whether they were informative, concise, useful, um, and all of that. So it's, it's very off-putting. And actually, post Bahrain, I had, did my review yesterday. It's bizarre hearing the sound of your own voice and often quite off-putting and quite quite disappointing when you realize that you say something and you sit there with your head in your hand saying why did I say that then or what was what was my thinking or yeah how did I miss that piece of information but when the world's going past quite quickly uh, it's very easy to miss things did you want to go through the, the slides that you've got or are you happy still having a chat I don't mind very happy having a chat so I to be honest uh, most of the stuff I prepped was potentially in response to questions that were in a bit more detail yeah. but in terms of um the kind of decision making aspect which i guess was the the second adage that i put on the title was uh it's actually some of the things i've learned from third party reading rather than necessarily taught through sport through work have been really interesting so obviously we all sit here and we think that we're very rational beings and we make good decisions all of the time and actually the number of biases that we exhibit is really quite disappointing when you think you even when you look at stuff and you think I know exactly what this situation is or I mean reading some of these books you look at stuff and you see see them challenge you and you know I know they're trying to challenge me how they're trying to challenge me and you still fall for it so there's a huge amount of biases and there's a huge number of things that you can do to try and improve your decision making quality um the really interesting thing that I found the most is, and I've got a quote for it here, is the premise that improving decisions is not just about uh, necessarily generating good outcomes, but it's increasing the chances of good outcomes rather than guaranteeing them. So <clears throat> there are plenty of opportunities where you make a decision and the, the situation goes against for you something outside of your control leads to a disappointing outcome and actually the key is to separate your outcomes from your decision making process and be able to understand that a bad outcome doesn't lead to a bad decision and a good outcome doesn't necessarily mean you've made the right decision <clears throat> we as people are very good at rewarding ourselves when things go well and putting it down to luck when things go badly and equally invert that and if you're looking at someone else's decision if it goes well for them almost always we'll assume it's a it's a, a fortune thing and if it goes badly it's because they've made a poor decision so being able to it's, i mean all of this is kind of basics in terms of when you think about it and actually put your mind to it but i don't know about any of you listening but i had never really thought about it in that much detail before so 
I mean, one of the prime examples I had, which actually I will pop up on the screen, was um, I'm sure many of you were watching the uh, test match between, let me flick through these and go to this one, watching the uh, test matches between England and India. And uh, being the semi-nerd that I am, I pulled out all of the data for uh, the fourth innings that have happened in the entire history of test cricket and decided to see how uh, the decision by Joe Root as to when to declare or whether to declare was correct or not. So I've put a little uh, caveat in there in that this is very much just the available data on quick info to me. So I'm sure the ECB have a lot more and I'm not accusing them of making a bad decision. But this is quite a good example whereby England ended up not declaring, they got bowled out and uh, they did still win the match. But if you take an objective hindsight or an objective uh, decision analysis process, you realise that they didn't necessarily make the best decision despite winning the match. So being able to separate the outcome of the win from the decision itself allows you to analyse that and improve without uh, the kind of closed loop. So in this situation, I've on my nice little chart going from left to right is the number of overs remaining in the match. And of the, I think it's just over a thousand test matches that have that I pulled the data out for, uh, the red line shows that the chance of losing that test match got lower and lower and lower and lower to being effectively zero to the nearest whole percent at 115 overs. And at this point, they, the marginal loss or the marginal chance of reducing uh, of, of losing actually didn't change at all. All that continuing to bat for did was reduce the chance of a victory by running out of overs. And it's not a hugely complex uh, concept, but all of these small things will end up adding uh, benefit over the period of a test year. We England have got 17 matches this year. So suddenly the statistical change of from 92% down to 85% of winning that test match actually plays out over the course of that year. If you've got 17 test matches, that's if you in, encompass this situation, that's one test match's worth. So uh, these small margins all do kind of begin to add up. And if you take that approach across 10 or 20 different decisions across the course of, uh, of a kind of sporting match, then uh, those outcomes can actually be quite a big decider between a good result and a poor one. Um, the second thing, so there's kind of two main uh, areas that I think are really key. So the first one was that fielding outcome, so making sure that we separate decisions from outcomes. And the other one is actually, again, really basic concept, but not thinking in uh, black or white, so zeros and a hundreds. And we, as a department now, whenever we discuss any situation within the race, within how he thinks it will play out, we try and put numbers on it. So a kind of an obvious example is kind of just a, uh, this kind of 60-40 split. Do you feel like this race is a one-stop race or a two-stop race? I feel like it's a one-stop race. In a historic world of myself, I'd say, okay, well, there we go. That's black and white. My opinion is one-stop. But actually, as soon as you start questioning how certain you are about that and how strong your belief is, then you can start to kind of understand a bit more about it. So are you 55, 45? Are you 70, 30? Are you 90, 10 in terms of how strongly you, you believe that? And as soon as you start thinking about things as uh, options and variable possibilities rather than the certainties that we tend to work in as human beings, the black and white world that we, we exist in, then you start to be able to uh, look at the kind of statistical outputs a bit more and improve your decision quality as a result. Um, so those are kind of the two main factors that are really key. And then I've got some examples to put them into other sports uh, if we'd like to. Yeah, so, to carry on. Uh, I've lost my, I've managed to lose my slideshow, so bear with me 30 seconds. Um, just trying to share. Oh. 
another good example I have is the world of rugby. So I'm sure many of you have been the topic of conversation between whether you should kick for goal or kick for touch in a rugby match. And so avoid the map at the we can avoid the map at the moment, but we have uh, effectively uh, to clarify the ground for those of you who aren't particularly big rugby fans. So if you kick pick a penalty for goal, you get three points. And if you kick for touch, you have the opportunity to take a line out and try and score a try. And if you convert that try, then that is a total of seven points. The difficulty lies in that you're a lot more likely to be able to kick the penalty than you are to be able to score the try from the line out. But the value from the line out is worth, or is worth just over double. So at this point, it becomes a very statistical exercise to at least be able to understand. And if we think back to what I said at the beginning about knowing, uh, knowing the fixed uh, fixed variables beforehand, then at least if you know the ground of uh, what the situation is, then you can make a decision on the fly. So the detailed numbers aren't hugely important here, but what we talk about from a statistical standpoint is effectively the expected number of points. So this is basically the average. If you did that, made that decision a thousand times, what would be the average number of points you get from it? So if you had uh, if you kicked a penalty for goal that's worth three points and you scored it half the time, then your expected value would be 1.5. So if we kind of look at that from a different standpoint and try and compare it to the points expected value from kicking for touch, then you can start to see what your decision should be from different areas of the pitch. So this map here, for those of you who know rugby well, will recognise it as a pitch. So that's the centre line down the middle, and then if you're kicking to the right. So <clears throat> what you see is the bright yellow spots are where you're most likely to score, and therefore the expected value goes up to 2.7, 2.8 in the middle of the pitch. But actually, as you get further and further back, uh, kind of from the halfway line in the middle, it's less than two. If we go on to... Uh, if we kicked for a line out, if we were a certain distance from the line, you can work out the expected value of the number of points you get from there. So the dotted red line is the value of the penalty. So if we can kick to the corner to within five metres, then we're actually more likely to get more points than we are kicking for, for goal from any position on the pitch that we can get to that, that spot. So all of a sudden, the kind of straightforward decision to kick the penalties when you can becomes a bit more of a less obvious decision when you look at it from a statistical standpoint. And the data for this study has come from the Premiership 2017 to 2019. So it's a huge number of games very recently. So it's quite representative. And actually, if we go onto this page, then this is the same map of the pitch, but this is the difference in points between kicking for touch and kicking for goal. And the really interesting output is that on every single place on the pitch, you should kick for touch from a purely statistical standpoint. And this is completely contrary to what all of the uh, commentators, all of the general population in and around rugby would perceive. And it's a really interesting area at the moment in sport generally, professional sport, because analytics are coming in and suggesting that all of the experience that coaches have built up built up is not necessarily applicable in all situations and uh, it becomes quite an interesting point in terms of how people react to that information use that information to try and improve their decision quality now i'm not saying that situation in the game doesn't have an influence but from a purely statistical standpoint and early on in a match where you've got 80 minutes to play, you should follow statistics more than at the end when the situation has started to get a bit more specific. Um, but there's huge areas where all sorts of teams in professional sport can improve their decision making and actually probably improve their outcomes as a result. Um, I won't go on to my final one, which uh, there's also a fantastic example in the American football, but that's a bit more detailed probably for this talk. But uh, they 
as a sport over the last five years have, have accepted this a lot more than any others. And the kind of quality and importance of analytics and data and statistical decision making. And as a result have moved on and you can see a huge shift in uh, the decisions that coaches are making and for, for the right reasons. It's kind of taken the emotion and spontaneity out of, of some sports and, and with, with hard data. And, and I think for some sports, particularly when you've got a radio link to someone's ear, I think it's it's quite easy to do that. And I, and I think perhaps the science behind F1 would probably dictate that. I think somebody in the ear to Johnny Wilkinson, I, I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing, but you know, it's, it's a really interesting way of looking at things. Um, I, mean, I mean, I personally, sorry to, to jump in, but no, I, no. I'm actually, from my sports fan point of view, disappointed because it kind of takes away the excitement and the, the professionalism of the sport means that you lose of sport means that you lose the uh, the opportunity for upsets and all of that kind of stuff which is what makes it exciting for you and me mm. so I really like the numbers and the statistical side <clears throat> I'm really disappointed from an entertainment value side of all of that stuff. Yeah. Maybe I could just ask a quick question just before we, we kind of open it up. And, and I think at this point, if anybody wanted to type in some questions, we've got about 10 in there already. If anybody wanted to type in some questions for Chris, I mean, there's an awful lot of F1-based questions and we'll go through all of those. If anybody wants to chuck their, put their hand up and ask Chris a question live, it'd be lovely to hear a few of, particularly of his contemporaries as well. It'd be quite nice to put them in contact with each other. My, my question was about leadership, really, which I think would translate to all people, whether they're sport interested or whether they're just working within a team in industry. You know, what, what, what is a success? I mean, you're right at the start of the season now. Do you spend a lot of time as a team talking about what a success is? You know, from an outsider's point of view, you know, I would be surprised if you're all kind of giving high fives and saying we're going to beat Lewis Hamilton this year. But, you know, but, but, but what is a success? Uh, and, and how and how do you work within a team? You've been there for, you know, a few years now. How do you how do you you know give me a good example of kind of how you've come together and and achieved a particular set of goals? I would say. Um, so, we in strategy group work very closely together. There's a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of uh, analytics. So we spend a lot of time post every event looking through what everyone else has done why they've done it, whether it makes sense, whether we would do it. So from our point of view, we effectively are trying to make better decisions than everyone else from a tactical standpoint. And if we're not given the fast enough car or our car isn't fast enough to be able to win the race, then so be it. But as long as we make the best decisions that we can at every opportunity, then that's the best that we can do. And we, as a group, have to respect that everyone else in the department who's manufacturing the car, putting together uh, at the weekend, trying to do set up and performance side, are also doing the same thing. Then hopefully we all move in the right direction. But you have to microanalyze yourself and make sure that you're doing your small part as well as you can. And hopefully then it all comes together. Okay, that's cool. Right, shall we start having a little look at some of these questions then, please? Right. Um, right, so first one from someone anonymous. So it says, my question is about how team strategy responds to disruptive incidents, in particular your response to Alonso's puncture in Baku in 2018 and his, ex and his success in returning the car to the pits despite having to drive on two wheels for the best part of a lap. How did you respond? Did you panic, Chris? Uh, interestingly, I remember that race very well. That was my fourth race and my first incident the those kind of races are actually almost easier to manage than the ones where you've got a lot riding on it you still have to be diligent because you can still fight your way back into it and i think we finished seventh in that race in the end having been last by about 30 seconds at one point um but a huge amount of it is staying calm and making sure that you are prepared enough to be able to deal with the situation so uh we, I mean, prime example there, but we, every, every single race, regardless of the situation, we work out what our, situa what, what our reaction would be to a first lap incident if we just had a puncture and we were off the back, if we had an, a, a crash and broke the front wing, a serious incident like that, we've pre-prepared our outcomes to all of those. And as a result, the decision live and in the event is actually just about picking which one of those is most relevant 
and hopefully just adjusting them a little bit. So I think the, the yeah the, the key thing from that point is you effectively you need to understand all of the fixed variables. So all of the things that are fixed beforehand, you need to <coughs> completely know the facts. So for the example I used from the rugby there, you need to know the statistical layout of the pitch. But what you don't know, and you just need to spend time preparing and working out, is how you react to all the variables. So for instance, what the score would be, if, if we were in a situation where we're three points down in that example, how would that influence our decision? If we're two points down, how does that influence your decision? And in this case, it was effectively uh, how far off the back of the pack are we and how much time do we have to make up? Mm. Okay. Right. Um, a question from Andrew Heinard, King, King, a good Kings family here. Look, so we got, um, Chris, were you interested in F1 before joining McLaren? Um, so again, I don't think we've ever had a conversation when you were at school about F1. I could be wrong. Okay. So I did a reasonably good job of hiding it from you when I was uh, watching races during prep then. <laughs> uh i was i was and probably still am not the world's biggest mega fan which might be disappointing to some of you um i really love my job for the challenges it has but i will admit that there are a huge number of people who are bigger motorsport fans than me out there mm. uh, i have all well probably since about the age of 12 or 13 i think through most of my king's time i was a reasonably big fan of uh, of, of f1 um watched most races but wasn't kind of an avid what one might call nerd over the whole thing um in fact i remember one of my friends fred a fred atchison gray <laughs> used to call me out on it the whole time and because i was talking about it too much and boring him with it and he'd had enough i think so definitely pre mclaren and at kings i was i was into it but probably easier dealing with alonso if you're not a super fan i'd have thought <laughs> yeah well, that's the thing you have to you very much have to remain professional with these guys but what you realize quite quickly is they're just employees of the company as well to the outside world they're the face of it but as soon as we get into the engineering office they are just as much guys working together as a group to try and try and achieve what we're trying to achieve great so great can we go to one of the live ones go to the top can we go to iron please iron yeah all wheels um, hello. Um, so um, there are like strategic changes um, from season to season, but like, are there going to be any changes uh, because of signs leaving uh, McLaren and his move to Ferrari? Even though, like, you are the strategist of Lando Norris. So we work closely together. So I know. So Darren, who is Carlos's strategist, I don't know if how much any of you follow it but you might have seen a social media video of Carlos and Darren having a chat um they he's now moved to Daniel Ricardo, so he, Daniel's our new driver when you get someone from a different team it's quite an interesting learning point because you use the information they have about how that team operates to try and see if there's any areas you can improve um but also trying to bring the, the new drivers up to speed with how we operate and I think one of the things that's been really insightful with uh, with Daniel is that all of his previous teams have kept the drivers less in the loop in terms of how they're executing a race. They very much seem to have just given instructions at certain points and expected the driver to do it rather than the way that we tend to operate, which is a bit more of a kind of inclusive information model where we're trying to keep a conversation open a bit more often, give the driver a bit more feedback on what they're what they're doing and uh, gather a bit more from them in terms of how the tyres are behaving and how that affects our race. Great stuff, thanks, Ryan. Um, uh, oh, go on. Uh, but is there like a specific change, um, like specifically for Lando Norris? Uh, no, I don't think so. So the biggest drop really from the strategy point of view is the tyres. So there's a small difference between the drivers and one of the big skills that they have is being able to manage the tires out. So, I mean, a very good driver would probably manage to get an extra three, maybe four laps on a 30 lap stint uh, compared to the average of the field, but predominantly uh, 
Uh, it's more about being able to execute the stuff that we're trying to achieve. So that would be being able to push when we ask them to push, being able to manage when we ask them to manage, uh, and kind of understanding wh what's important at that stage of the race. That's great. Thank you. Um, a chap called Ian Poon, I'm not sure you've heard of him before. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he just simply asked, is Lando champion material? I think we're getting there. It's quite an interesting, uh, but actually, firstly, hi Ian, how are you doing? <laughs> One of my uh, schoolhouse year comrades. Um, we are getting there. He is very much got the driving ability, uh, but F1 champions, there's a lot more to it. So one of the things that we tried to kind of nail down with Lando from the start is that you can be the fastest guy across a lap, but with the current way that Formula One works, you need to be the best at starts, you need to be the best through the pit lane, you need to be the best at overtaking, and all of those things are stuff that's not really covered at a junior formula level. At junior formula, it's all about just being fast across a single lap and time management and all of those extra factors aren't really analyzed to the same level. So those are all the bits that we're trying to train people up with. And when I spoke earlier about bringing Lando in from from the start for his first season, that's all the kind of hard work that we have to do with them. Great stuff. Um, good question here from Sam Casey. It says in the in the just completed pre-season testing, how much of a part do you play in, for instance, sandbagging, especially with the Mercedes drama after last weekend, and practicing with each of the different race strategies in preparation for the season? Um, so, to an extent, the sandbagging stuff is a team by team choice. Um, we at McLaren will just run how we see fit to achieve the run program we want. And if that means running at a certain pace, that's one thing. And if it means running uh, and pushing flat out, then that's completely understandable. So while some teams try and do a bit more of a political maneuver to try and sway people's assessment of the field and competitivity, to be honest, when you've got three days of testing, you just have to get the most out of those three days. And from our point of view, that means running the plan we want to run to make the best engineering program and the best decisions. Um, everyone, I think, is well aware that Mercedes have done a fair amount of this sandbagging for the last uh, few seasons, which for those of you who are less clued up on the terminology, it's effectively filling the car up to the top with fuel so it weighs an extra 100 kilograms and it's a lot slower around the circuit to hide performance. Um, but I think from our point of view, those kind of politics are not really where we are at the moment. If we are winning championships, then you might consider it. Yeah. Okay. I'll take one of Angus Robson's questions um, here. So what about, so did you run any trial race strategies before your first race with Alonso or did you just literally get thrown in at the deep end? So, <laughs> so we have, um, we actually run a practice race every weekend. So uh, we have some simulation tools that we use uh, to train people up, I ran loads of them over the winter, well, this winter and every winter, but particularly before my first season. Um, you can set the race up. I'm sure lots of you have probably played online equivalents of it, but you can set the race up to give you all of the information that you would normally have during a race, um, model overtaking and paces and all of that kind of stuff, and then uh, try and make decisions as you go. The difficult thing is, and the thing that you will never be able to replace is <clears throat> the adrenaline and the requirement to communicate. So uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting in the world that we're in, where you've got a lot of very clued up engineering personnel, and I think a lot of you will probably share the opinion that occasionally engineers can be uh, slightly less good at communicating and uh, information is that in reality, you can come up with the best strategy in the world, but if you can't pass that through an engineering, through your operational team and make it understood by your driver such that it's actually executable, then it's not worth having. So, um, yeah, the, the key thing that I could never prepare for was uh, the pressure and the comm stuff. You can run as many races as you like on your decision quality, but... The, uh, yeah, the difficult thing is communicating that in the heat of the moment when you've got 20 seconds to do so. 
Yeah, that sounds horrible. Um, <laughs> Greg, can we open it up to Adam Plunkett at the top? That'd be great. Another old schoolhouse boy. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hi, Adam. Yeah, so um, I was asking, uh, well, obviously, you said that there's a ton of metrics within a Formula One race, especially live data. So how much use is there of AI and machine learning within a live race to help kind of rule out some of the worst decisions and give you like an option or five to then choose from? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's uh, used in a fair few areas. Um, probably not going to go into the intricate details uh, just because it's quite a sensitive thing at the moment. But we're currently in the process of trying to apply some of that stuff to our kind of strategy logic. So effectively trying to train things to rule out the obvious such that we can focus our human power on the uh, more subjective things. So, right, for example, if there's, if there's a safety car, there's two or three, probably a few more actually, like, categoric checkboxes where if you're in situation X, you should definitely not pit. And if you're in situation Y, you should definitely pit. So we're trying to train some stuff up to read that those situations a bit more clearly for our competitors so that we can at least uh, earn ourselves from the human decision-making point of view uh, some more time to make our decisions. I think in reality, probably not that many years away from an AI model being at least as good as us at our job. But I think at the moment, we don't have the resources to train it. Basically the answer. <laughs> I might be out of a job in a few years time. Um, from another one, thanks Adam. Um, one from Nicholas Bromfield. Um, hi, by the way. Um, on a race weekend from the UK factory, do you communicate with the on-track team or directly with the driver? So we operate, the best way of describing it would be like a wheel and spoke type model. So the driver has comms with one person only, who's his race engineer. He's at the track on the pit wall. In fact, if on the occasions that I'm at the circuit, he's sitting right to my left, which is quite nice. Um, and we effectively have all of the specialists that then feed into the center of that wheel. So, and then Will will communicate what's necessary to the driver. So for instance, you've got me on race strategy on one spoke, you've got the aero performance guys who are looking at how the aerodynamics of the car is behaving and whether there's problems there. You've got vehicle performance guys who are looking at the vehicle dynamics. You've got the guys who are looking at the tires, uh, and how they're behaving, all feeding into that kind of central hub. And it's then his responsibility to also pass that information to the relevant others. So for instance, the tire guys will feed any information to the center and it's Will's responsibility to then give that to me if it's relevant to the strategy uh, and to the driver if it's relevant to how he's driving and, and so on. You mentioned tyres there a little bit, I can get another question done here. So what kind of data do you take into consideration when deciding tyre strategy? So we effectively build a tyre model from the pace of the tyre at the beginning and then the degradation uh, which is, put simply, how much slower it gets over the course of the stint. So as you go around, you wear off rubber off the surface and it, heat, it, it begins to overheat, and that causes the tyre to get slower and slower. And from that model, which is reasonably representative, pretty accurate, you can then kind of generate a theoretical optimum strategy, and we, different, we split that into two. So that side of it we call the strategy. So that then gives you how many stops you should make, what the tires you should use are, uh, and roughly how and exactly how long the stints should be. So that's quite clear cut. But the interesting part from like the human point of view then becomes what we call the tactics, which is how you implement that relative to the cars around you. So quite often that strategy is quite insensitive to a few laps. So if you pit a couple of laps earlier, a couple of laps later than the, uh, the theoretical optimum, it's quite insensitive on overall time, but it gives you the opportunity to jump cars around you by being on new tyres when they're on old ones and then they pit a bit later, or uh, alternatively by running the tyres in different sequences, you can put yourselves in different bits of the track. So that's the kind of tactical and live decision side. 
uh, as opposed to the theory. And I would say, just for some general information, that probably you can make up probably in the region of five to eight seconds over the course of a race through tactics. But if you're out of bed on the strategy, then which in terms of number of stops and tyres you use, then you're going to be nowhere. So there are some races, which are the ones that you guys probably find very boring, where our hands are tied because there's only one theoretical option available to us. And there's others where there's two or three that are quite close together and we can try and do some clever stuff and do something a bit different to the guys in around, around us. Mm. But that kind of varies circuit to circuit. You've spoken a lot about analytics tonight, um, but would you ever say that you've ever gone with your gut, uh, maybe in a kind of a virtual safety car period? Have you ever kind of just gone, yeah, let's give that a whirl? Uh, yeah, but this is the big but. You, the whole skill of it is training your gut to be as close to right as you can be. So often in the high pressure and high speed situations, uh, and I, the one that will stick with me forever was in Belgium this year. I think we had four seconds to get Lando in the pit lane from when the safety car was deployed and we just about made it. Um, those kind of decisions have to be gut because you just see it and you react and you shout something and you hope that driver has time to get in. But the, the, the key skill is making sure that you're aware that if there's a safety car on lap 10 and you've got three cars behind you who are running on a certain tire and the gaps to the other cars are like this, then your gut should say pit. And that's the really challenging part is effectively training yourself through the build up through the race weekend to understand the situation well enough that your your gut is effectively a logical, rational decision. Question from Matt Stonia. So this one is a little bit about kind of is there what's your favorite race on the F1 calendar? I think this is not weather and hotels. This is from a kind of a strategic point of view. <laughs> is there a, is there a slightly more interesting Grand Prix for a strategist? So there are two, one at each extreme that are really good, I think. So the most interesting because it's fast moving is probably Bahrain um, high de degradation track so the tires fall off the cliff quite quickly normally multiple stops um, and overtaking is quite easy so those three factors kind of come together to make it quite a tactically difficult race because there's a lot going on and there's a lot of variables for you to play with at completely the opposite end of the spectrum is probably Singapore where overtaking is almost impossible and so the decisions of where you pit and what cars you're willing to pit behind suddenly become very challenging yeah. and you almost always have drivers that are complaining about uh, tyres have gone off they're going slower and slower and slower but there's a, a slow car bit a Williams a Haas or something else on just at the point where you'd come out if you pitted and you've got to try and get make sure that you can get in front of that car. So you've got drivers whinging at you on one hand, you've got traffic issues on the other hand, and you're trying to balance the risk of the driver putting it in the wall by staying out, but making sure that you don't completely compromise your race by dropping yourself into traffic. So that's probably the hardest dis outright decision to make. Um, yeah, but the Bahrain race is most fun because it's just out and out madness for two hours. Sounds good. Um, Greg, should we go to the top of the list live? Should we go to Stanley Weir? Uh, hello. Hi, Stan. Hey, um, I was wondering, obviously you've spoken a lot about what happens on the Sunday, but uh, obviously with the modern day tyres in Formula One, a lot of it's actually decided on whether or not you can make it to Q3 on the medium or the soft tyre, especially in a place like Mexico where the tyres degrade quickly. And I was wondering what McLaren's mantra in general is towards that, whether or not you would go for Q3 potentially qualifying on the worst race tyre, but starting up higher on the grid, or maybe sacrificing the Q2, but to be able to extend the first in. And also, I was just wondering, what is it like working under Andrea Seidel and Zach Brown? And do you think they're the men who are going to take McLaren to their first title since 2007? Thank you. Wow. Okay, so I'll answer, I'll answer the first one. Um, <laughs> Then if I remember, I'll talk about Andreas and Zach. <laughs> so 
this actually ties quite nicely into the bit I was talking about earlier about black and white 100% decisions. So <clears throat> there are effectively those, again, introducing the rules to those of you who know F1 less well. If you are in the top 10 in qualifying, then you have to start on the tyre. You have to start on a tyre that you qualified on in a certain session during qualifying. So that kind of ties the race and qualifying together. And at some events, uh, the tyre that you would choose to qualify on can be a very poor race tyre. So from that point of view, to answer your question, Stanley, you, we spend an awful lot of time deciding from the race circumstance we envisage, how we see the race playing out as to what qualifying position we would be willing to start on a soft and what positions it becomes difficult. So uh, often in this situation, the car that starts 11th, so has the first car with free choice, will choose to start on a medium tyre. And then if you were, say, 10th, just in front of that car that has a massive tyre advantage, then you'd say, actually, I don't want to be there on a fixed tyre choice. But when it comes to ninth, it becomes a bit harder when it becomes to eighth. So you then have to start trying to balance where you'd be willing to qualify, where you think you might qualify, as to whether you're willing to take that risk or not. Particularly in the current regime of F1, where if you ignore Mercedes and Red Bull, it has never been tighter. Uh, it is a huge risk to start trying to play with not getting into Q3 because you could quite happily finish or qualify 15th or 16th before, well, not 16th because it's out of Q2, but you could quite happily end up 15th on the grid by trying to be too clever and actually in any situation, I think you'd prefer to be in Q3 than in, in the top 10 on the wrong tyre than to be too far back by trying to be too clever. And I think the mantra that we at McLaren have taken recently is that it's a 23 race season. And if you try and be too clever, you will almost always shoot yourself in the foot. So actually over the course of a season, statistics and following the simple and easy decisions is generally going to help. Part two, Zach and Andreas. Uh, I think Zach in particular has brought like a really fun, jovial atmosphere to the team. So I think you'll probably have seen it with Carlos and Lando and now Daniel as well with the drivers making a big difference, but like the mood and the environment amongst the group of us is so much better. And everyone loves being there now. The, the mood's lifted, the drivers are around a lot, which kind of motivates people. Uh, so I think that's positive. And the good thing about Andreas is he trusts us. So he, thinking back to what I said about the decisions being made predominantly at a reasonably low level, he trusts us to, kind of be the specialist in our area and to, to make the right decisions without interjecting too much. And he trusts us to review things when they've gone wrong. And if, they, if we do that properly, then he's very good at kind of uh, putting his faith in, in the team. That's great. Thanks, Dan, that's great questions. Um, I can probably do quite a few at once here. And a lot of questions about kind of balance between car and driver. So maybe I could ask the question, what would Lewis Hamilton do in one of your cars? I might disappoint a few people here by saying I don't think he'd probably be that much better than most of the others. Uh, he's a very good driver, but he's not enough better than a lot of the guys around us to, uh, to make a huge difference. Yeah. Interestingly, before we signed Carlos Sainz in 2018, we did a, a proper analysis of, of drivers when the, there was a big shift up. And I think our actual conclusion at that point was that our number one driver to chase would be Daniel Ricciardo. And so we're now very happy that he's joining us next year, just because his all round performance in the car and out of it contributes more to the team, we believe, than, than Lewis would. That's great, thanks. Um, can we go live to Estelle, mainly because I've got a teacher tomorrow and if I don't do this, she's not gonna be happy. <laughs> go on Estelle, it's all yours. Um, thank you, sir. <laughs> so I, my question is, how has the rules and regulation changes affect the team? And for instance, do the new tyres and new floors change how you would carry out a race? Or is the cost cap affecting how the team is running? And if you have time, my second question would be, why pit during a safety car? And why, and instead of, um, why, why would you pit during, um, 
kind of like a an accident time surely there would be better times to do a pit stop so question number one if i get it can remember it right is the changes to the cars and the floor um so from a strategic standpoint which is my area of expertise they don't really change anything the all it's done really is take performance off the cars so that they'll, they'll be slightly slower but we work on effectively we work on deltas you'll have heard the term delta thrown about f1 related gossip yeah <laughs> uh, effectively difference to a reference and all that the floors have done really is move that reference slightly so from the kind of standpoint where we operate it shouldn't have changed a huge amount it might have mixed up the grid a little bit because some teams will have uh, reacted differently to it it will have hurt some teams concepts a bit more than others but uh, certainly the little information we have from winter testing means that I don't think it's changed too much and then for the second question regarding the incidents so effectively the big decision is from all the strategic stuff is if you pit where do you come out on the track and we call this the pit loss. So in a normal race, when you go through the, or in a normal racing pit stop, when you go through the pit lane, the cars going far past the pit lane are going at full speed. So typically that means that you lose about 20 seconds by going through the pit lane. <clears throat> under a, when there's an incident under a safety car or, or such, then the cars on the track are going quite a lot slower. So you can go through the pit lane at the same speed, but the cars on the track are going slower. So relative to them, you lose less time. So typically you'd lose in the region of 12 seconds. <clears throat> um, so in essence, by doing an incident safety car pit stop, you've gained eight seconds back effectively for free. Um, and if you remember back to what I was saying about the strategy stuff earlier, eight seconds to 10 seconds is roughly where it becomes uh, dominant in terms of the strategy you're doing and being able to make up that race time in tactics, which is why typically if there's a safety car at the right time, people will all do the same thing because it's just the theoretical optimum. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Um, quite a few questions. I mean, I suppose about Formula E as well. It's on the television and a few questions about kind of, I suppose, new road cars in the UK <laughs> being electric by 2030. Um, do you think F1 strategy will go all electric or instead work on clever additives that minimise the adverse effects of combustion engine on track and road? I must admit, I don't know. It's currently a big conversation that's happening in the background at the moment. And actually, the thing that we've done really badly is selling how awesome the current cars are. So uh, I don't know the, like, the levels of... Uh, information that you guys have but typically a road car will be something like 25 percent to 28 percent efficient in terms of converting energy and fuel to moving we've just broken 50 in uh in f1 which is almost well closing down on the like the theoretical ceiling of i think it's this is throwing me back to second year thermodynamics now but i think it's something like 66 67 percent is the kind of theoretical ceiling on what you can get from energy through combustion or from fuel through combustion. Great stuff. They're pretty impressive bits of kit. Question from my godson here. I better ask this as well. So was there any, this is from Ben Cook. So was there any extra challenge preparing for the races that were newly added last season, like Imola or Bahrain? Yeah, it's actually really interesting because you have no... I mean, I really enjoy, enjoyed it because the older guys in the company have lots of experience and normally uh, try and convince us that the race is going to run one way because it's always happened that way. <clears throat> Didn't have their experience to fall back on. So we could read a race from our knowledge of the situation and from all the numbers that we see and how we see the race weekend playing out. And we could direct it from there without having... Uh, external influence from those who are slightly overpowered by experience it's definitely a harder challenge because all of your parameters you have to tune um, we don't know what most of those numbers are at the start of the weekend so we have to try and uh, kind of understand how the tires are going to behave how the what the pit loss is going to be 
uh, what the pace difference between cars will be because that has a huge influence on the strategy, all of that kind of stuff. So there's a lot to learn at those events, but those kind of make it more fun, really. Okay, so Greg, can we go to Paddy McLaughlin um, live? You might remember Paddy, Chris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hey, Hello Paddy. Go. Hi, mate. Yeah. Um, on on Red or perhaps generally, um, what's the relationship um, across the garage between strategists and mechanics? Is it a collaborative atmosphere or is it more isolated? And then my final question is, are we going to see you on Drive Survive coming out? <laughs> so generally, I mean, so I've ended up having a bit more of a relationship with the mechanics because I've been doing some work on pit stops in the background, but generally we don't have a huge amount of interaction. So the strategic stuff happens quite independently. So we have a group of people who are working on strategy um, and we will give an instruction to pit as and when we think it's appropriate. And then that is executed by an independent group of people uh, as and when that instruction is fed. So the whole point is to try and take uh, time, effort and emphasis away from us because we effectively want the act of giving an instruction to be as simple as possible so that we can carry on focusing on running the race. Um, what was your second question again? I've forgotten, sorry. <laughs> it was, uh, are, are you making a cameo on Drive Survive? Uh, I think that's probably unlikely. I might be in the background somewhere. I don't really know. The cameras are everywhere, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so, Thanks, Paddy. Um, there's a question here. I mean, maybe we can just finish with this one. There's loads of great questions here. And, 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 and probably what I'll do is I'll, I'll put them on a list for, for Chris. And given that he's in quarantine anyway, he's got nothing else to do. Um, <laughs> he can certainly answer these. Um, and we can ping this back through the OK office and field some of these. The last question, I think, was from Mr. Singfield and uh, um, from Major Vintner. And again, they were asking a little bit about whether, you're, whether your experience on coast to coast made you realise that you could do a better job with wheels uh, you know, on a Formula One car rather than cycling across the country. So um, I'm not sure that deserves much of an answer. Um, uh, Mr. McFall as well here, while well, I'm scrolling down as well, he certainly taught you massively at some point, asked yes. you a little bit about with this kind of analytical approach to sport, do you ever gamble on sport? Um, it's quite an interesting one. I was thinking that earlier. No, because I uh, almost always lose. <laughs> no, I generally don't because I upsets me to take the kind of emphasis away from the fun of sport mm. so because I do enough of it in my working life I generally prefer to watch sport and just concentrate on like who I support and what I want the outcome to be and I find that gambling on it you always skew your kind of uh, desired outcome so like I would never want to bet on the team I'm supporting or against them or anything because it just puts a different skew on it and I don't enjoy it as much. Great stuff. I mean, Chris, thanks for your time tonight, mate. Um, busy time in the F1 calendar. It's really nice to see you again. Um, all the best with this season. Um, and again, as I said, I will put everybody in touch. Lots of questions we didn't get to. Um, and, and again, I'll send those on to Chris. Yeah, thanks. cheers, Matt. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I'll try and answer them all as, as and when. No worries. Thank you. Over to you, Greg. Look, uh, Chris and Matt, thank you so much, Matt. It, it, I think that sort of come across really strongly to me is that sort of the maintaining of the bond of of house master with 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 people in in the house and uh hearing the stories and uh, and read and hearing the report was it was absolutely fascinating and uh uh chris I, I really enjoyed i'm a sports nut like uh like matt and uh and yourself and i really enjoyed seeing the statistics can i just ask you know so things like that um uh that rugby example right you know that's all kickers though I mean, if you had the best kicker in the in, in ever in your team, would that then alter what you're going to do? Or if you were hopeless at lineouts and you knew, well, actually, that might be the statistics. So, would you alter the statistics over time based upon your team, or do you actually, or do you actually keep it as broad as what you're showing there? So, I actually prepared for this. So, this one is where you might kick from if you had the absolute best kicker that's ever been and the absolute worst line-out performance it's ever been. So just in those two little red circles. Right, okay, I understand. So, uh, yeah, it, it makes an influence, but the range from the best to the worst of kickers is like 15%, and in the line-outs, it's maybe 20%, and that gives you the outcomes here. Um, 
absolutely so, fantastic. Have to be Thank aware. You. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I, if, if we had a lot more time, I'd love to see what you've done on the NFL stuff. Uh, my eldest son would just be you know, sort of thrilled to, 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 to see the statistics you've got there at some stage. Anyway, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for your time. You're such a busy man. And, uh, I, and I know you've just come back from overseas. So I, we really appreciate your time. Um, it, it was absolutely uh, uh, enlightening. We haven't had, I don't think I've ever seen so many questions come through and so many <laughs> hands come up. In, in any talk, uh, and that's a testament to, to how much interest uh, you, you, you gathered from, from everybody watching. And uh, um, so uh, it was just absolutely fascinating hearing about the inner workings of, a, of an F1 team. So uh, uh, thank you so much. And thank you again, Matt. It was, uh, uh, you know, I really appreciated you hosting, hosting and asking the questions. Uh, so it was absolutely superb. Yeah. Um, good luck with the rest of the season, Chris, on behalf of everybody here at Kings. Um, you know, and uh, and please, you know, the doors always welcome here in Canterbury when uh, uh, when we're not so much in COVID times to uh, to come back and visit. Uh, uh, you you must do it. Yeah, thanks very much for having me, and I yeah definitely will be back at some point. Thanks. Feel free, feel free to send some tickets. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> if okay, Excellent. I got any. <laughs> right and uh look the final thing for me is thank you so much for for, for tuning in tonight we have one more king's talk this uh before easter that's next thursday night march 25th it's oks joe bondati is giving a talk and uh and watch out for the uh advertisement on that soon and uh thank you again and have a very good night thank you <laughs>